Saturday, 27 November 1943. Dear Kitty, Yesterday evening, before I fell asleep, who should suddenly appear before my eyes but Lee's? I saw her in front of me, clothed in rags, her face thin and worn. Her eyes were very big, and she looked so sadly and reproachfully at me that I could read in her eyes, Oh, Anna, why have you deserted me? Help, oh, help me, rescue me from this hell. And I cannot help her. I can only look on how others suffer and die and can only pray to God to send her back to us. I just saw Lee's, no one else, and now I understand. I misjudged her and was too young to understand her difficulties. She was attached to a new girlfriend, and to her it seemed as though I wanted to take her away. What the poor girl must have felt like, I know. I know the feeling so well myself. Sometimes, in a flash, I saw something of her life, but a moment later I was selfishly absorbed again in my own pleasures and problems. It was horrid of me to treat her as I did, and now she looked at me oh so helplessly with her pale face and imploring eyes. Oh, God, if only that I, I should have all I could wish for and that she should be seized by such a terrible fate. I am not more virtuous than she. She too wanted to do what was right. Why should I be chosen to live and she probably to die? What was the difference between us? Why are we so far from each other now? Quite honestly, I haven't thought about her for months. Yes, almost a year. Not completely forgotten her, but still I had never thought about her like this until I saw her before me in all her misery. Oh, Lise, I hope that if you live until the end of the war, you will come back to us and that I shall be able to take you in and do something to make up for the wrong I did you. But when I am able to help her again, then she will not need my help so badly as now. I wonder if she ever thinks of me. If so, what would she feel? Good Lord, defend her so that at least she is not alone. Oh, if only you could tell her that I think lovingly of her and with sympathy, perhaps that would give her greater endurance. I must not go on thinking about it, because I don't get any further. I only keep seeing her great big eyes and cannot free myself from them. I wonder if Lise has real faith in herself and not only what has been thrust upon her. I don't even know. I never took the trouble to ask her. Lise, Lise, if only I could take you away. If only I could let you share all the things I enjoy. It is too late now. I can't help or repair the wrong I have done. But I shall never forget her again, and I shall always pray for her. Yours, Anna. Monday, 6 November 1943. Dear Kitty, when St. Nicholas Day approached... None of us could help thinking of the prettily decorated basket we had last year, and I especially thought it would be very dull to do nothing at all this year. I thought a long time about it until I invented something, something funny. I consulted Pim, and a week ago we started composing a little poem for each person. On Sunday evening at a quarter to eight, we appeared upstairs with a large laundry basket between us, decorated with little figures and bows of pink and blue carbon copy paper. The basket was covered with a large piece of brown paper on which a letter was pinned. Everyone was rather astonished at the size of the surprise package. I took the letter from the paper and read, Santa Claus has come once more, though not quite as he came before. We can't celebrate his day in last year's fine and pleasant way, for then our hopes were high and bright. All the optimists seemed right, none supposing that this year we would welcome Santa here. Still... We'll make his spirit live, and since we've nothing left to give, we've thought of something else to do. Each please look inside his shoe. As each owner took his shoe from the basket, there was a resounding peal of laughter. A little paper package lay in each shoe with the address of the shoe's owner on it. Wednesday, yours 22 on. December 1943. Dear Kitty, a bad attack of flu has prevented me from riding you until today. It's wretched to be ill here. When I wanted to cough, one, two, three, I crawled under the blankets and tried to stifle the noise. Usually the only result was that the tickle wouldn't go away at all, and milk and honey, sugar or lozenges had to be brought into operation. It makes me dizzy to think of all the cures that were tried on me. Sweating, compresses, wet cloths on my chest, dry cloths on my chest, hot drinks, gargling, 
throat painting, lying still, cushion for extra warmth, hot water bottles, lemon squashes, and, in addition, the thermometer every two hours. Can anyone really get better like this? The worst moment of all was certainly when Mr. Dussel thought he'd play doctor and came and lay on my naked chest with his greasy head in order to listen to the sounds within. Not only did his hair tickle unbearably, but I was embarrassed, in spite of the fact that he once, thirty years ago, studied medicine and has the title of doctor. Why should the fellow come and lie on my heart? He's not my lover, after all. For that matter, he wouldn't hear whether it's healthy or unhealthy inside me anyway. His ears need syringing first, as he's becoming alarmingly hard of hearing. But that is enough about illness. I'm as fit as a fiddle again, one centimeter taller, two pounds heavier, pale and with a real appetite for learning. There's not much news to tell you. We are all getting on well together for a change. There's no quarreling. We haven't had such peace in the home for at least a half a year. Ellie is still parted from us. We received extra oil for Christmas, sweets and syrup. The chief present is a brooch made out of a two-and-a-half-cent piece and shining beautifully. Anyway, lovely but indescribable. Mr. Dussel gave Mummy and Mrs. Von Don a lovely cake which she had asked me up to bake for him. With all her work, she has to do that as well. I have also something for me up and Ellie. For at least two months, I have saved the sugar from my porridge, you see, and with Mr. Coupuy's help... I'll have it made into fondants. It is drizzly weather. The stove smells. The food lies heavily on everyone's tummy, causing thunderous noises on all sides. The war at a standstill. Morale Friday, rotten. 24 December, 1943. Dear Kitty, I have previously written about how much we are affected by atmospheres here, and I think that in my own case this trouble is getting much worse lately. Himmelhock Jokzend und zum Tode betrübt certainly fits here. Footnote. A famous line from Goethe. On top of the world or in the depths of despair. I am Himmelhock Jokzend. If I only think how lucky we are here compared with other Jewish children. And zum Tode betrübt comes over me when, as it happened yesterday, for example, Mrs. Kupuis comes and tells us about her daughter Corey's hockey club, canoe trips, theatrical performances, and friends. I don't think I'm jealous of Corey, but I couldn't help feeling a great longing to have lots of fun myself for once, and to laugh until my tummy ached. Especially at this time of the year, with all the holidays for Christmas and the New Year, we are stuck here like outcasts. Still... I really ought not to write this, because it seems ungrateful and I've certainly been exaggerating. But still, whatever you think of me, I can't keep everything to myself, so I'll remind you of my opening words. Paper is patient. When someone comes in from outside with the wind in their clothes and the cold on their faces, then I could bury my head in the blankets to stop myself thinking, when will we be granted the privilege of smelling fresh air? And because I must not bury my head in the blankets, but the reverse, I must keep my head high and be brave. The thoughts will come not once, but, oh, countless times. Believe me, if you have been shut up for a year and a half, it can get too much for you some days. In spite of all justice and thankfulness, you can't crush your feelings. Cycling, dancing, whistling, looking out into the world, feeling young, to know that I'm free. That's what I long for. Still, I mustn't show it, because I sometimes think if all eight of us began to pity ourselves or went about with discontented faces, where would it lead us? I sometimes ask myself, would anyone, either Jew or non-Jew, understand this about me, that I am simply a young girl badly in need of some rollicking fun? I don't know, and I couldn't talk about it to anyone, because then I know I should cry. Crying can bring such relief. In spite of all my theories and however much trouble I take, each day I miss having a real mother who understands me. That is why with everything I do and write, I think of the mumsy that I want to be for my children later on. The mumsy who doesn't take everything that is said in general conversation so seriously, but who does take what I say seriously. I have noticed, though I can't explain how, that the word mumsy tells you everything. Do you know what I found? 
To give me the feeling of calling Mummy something which sounds like Mumsy, I often call her Mum. Then from that comes Mums, the incomplete Mumsy, as it were, whom I would so love to honor with the extra I.E., and yet who does not realize it. It's a good thing, because it would only make her unhappy. That's enough about that. Writing has made my Zoom toe de betrupt go off a bit. Saturday, 25 December, 1943. Dear Kitty, during these days, now that Christmas is here, I find myself thinking all the time about Pim and what he told me about the love of his youth. Last year I didn't understand the meaning of his words as well as I do now. If he'd only talk about it again, perhaps I would be able to show him that I understand. I believe that Pym talked about it because he who knows the secrets of so many other hearts had to express his own feelings for once, because otherwise Pym never says a word about himself, and I don't think Margot has any idea of all Pym has had to go through. Poor Pym, he can't make me think that he has forgotten everything. He will never forget this. He has become very tolerant. I hope that I shall grow a bit like him without having to go through all that. Yours, Anna. Monday, 27 December, 1943. Dear Kitty, on Friday evening, for the first time in my life, I received something for Christmas. Coupuis, Crawler, and the girls had prepared a lovely surprise again. Miep has made a lovely Christmas cake, on which was written Peace, 1944. Ellie had provided a pound of sweet biscuits of pre-war quality, for Paige and Margot and me, a bottle of yogurt and a bottle of beer for each of the grown-ups. Everything was so nicely done up, and there were pictures stuck on the different packages. Otherwise, Christmas passed by quickly for us. Yours, Anna. Wednesday, 29 December, 1943. Dear Kitty, I was very unhappy again last evening. Granny and Lee's came into my mind. Granny, oh, darling Granny... How little we understood of what she suffered, or how sweet she was. And besides all this, she knew a terrible secret which she carefully kept to herself the whole time. Footnote, a severe internal disease. How faithful and good Granny always was. She would never have let one of us down. Whatever it was, however naughty I'd been, Granny always stuck up for me. Granny, did you love me, or didn't you understand me either? I don't know. No one ever talked about themselves to Granny. How lonely Granny must have been. How lonely in spite of us. A person can be lonely even if he is loved by many people, because he is still not the one and only to anyone. And Lise, is she still alive? What is she doing? Oh, God, protect her and bring her back to us. Lise, I see in you all the time what my lot might have been. I keep seeing myself in your place. Why, then, should I often be unhappy over what happens here? Shouldn't I always be glad, contented, and happy? Except when I think about her and her companions in distress. I am selfish and cowardly. Why do I always dream and think of the most terrible things? My fear makes me want to scream out loud sometimes. Because still, in spite of everything, I have not enough faith in God. He has given me so much, which I certainly do not deserve and I still do much that is wrong every day. If you think of your fellow creatures, then you only want to cry. You could really cry the whole day long. The only thing to do is to pray that God will perform a miracle and save some of them, and I hope that I am doing that enough. Sunday, 2 Sunday. January, 1944. Dear Kitty, This morning when I had nothing to do, I turned over some of the pages of my diary, and several times I came across letters dealing with the subject mummy in such a hot-headed way that I was quite shocked and asked myself, Anna, is it really you who mentioned hate? Oh, Anna, how could you? I remained sitting with the open page in my hand and thought about it and how it came about that I should have been so brimful of rage and really so filled with such a thing as hate that I had to confide it all in you. I have been trying to understand the Anna of a year ago, and to excuse her, because my conscience isn't clear as long as I have to leave you with these accusations, without being able to explain, on looking back, how it happened. I suffer now, and suffered then, from moods which kept my head under water, so to speak, and only allowed me to see the things subjectively, 
without enabling me to consider quietly the words of the other side, and to answer them as the words of one whom I, with my hot-headed temperament, had offended or made unhappy. I hid myself within myself. I only considered myself and quietly wrote down all my joys, sorrows, and contempt in my diary. This diary is of great value to me, because it has become a book of memoirs in many places, but on a good many pages I could certainly put past and done with. I used to be furious with Mummy, and still am sometimes. It's true that she doesn't understand me, but I don't understand her either. She did love me very much, and she was tender, but as she landed in so many unpleasant situations through me, and was nervous and irritable because of other worries and difficulties, it is certainly understandable that she snapped at me. I took it much too seriously, was offended, and was rude and aggravating to Mummy, which in turn made her unhappy. So it was really a matter of unpleasantness and misery rebounding all the time. It wasn't nice for either of us, but it is passing. I just didn't want to see all this and pitied myself very much, but that too is understandable. Those violent outbursts on paper were only giving vent to anger, which in a normal life could have been worked off by stamping my feet a couple of times in a locked room or calling mummy names behind her back. The period when I caused mummy to shed tears is over. I have grown wiser, and mummy's nerves are not so much on edge. I usually keep my mouth shut if I get annoyed, and so does she, so we appear to get on much better together. I can't really love Mummy in a dependent, childlike way. I just don't have that feeling. I soothe my conscience now with the thought that it is better for hard words to be on paper than that Mummy should carry them in her heart.